All right, so the question class, the super class, that code is already provided for you. Um, it's a question that has a, a text. Think of that as like the prompt and an answer. So we have a couple of, of private instance variables here, the text or the prompt of the question, that's a string. The answer to the question, that's a string. Um, so we could, this is useful, we could use this. The default constructor doesn't really do anything. It leaves text and answer null. We have another constructor where you can pass in the question and it will call the set text method to, to set that um, question as the prompt. Um, so here's our mutator method that sets the text instance variable to the specified parameter. Here's a mutator method that sets the answer. Um, and then we have another method here that checks the answer. So this is like what the student would enter and we'll see if their response equals the answer to the question and it returns true or false. We also wrote a two string method. This could be used by like the exam program to display the prompt um, and it just returns the, the prompt. So this would be fine, we could use this, um, but in our testing software, we want to provide teachers more than just this type of a question with a prompt and you have to match the answer exactly. We wanna do a fill in the blank. We wanna do a multiple choice one. Um, so let's do, so we're gonna write a subclass of the question class that allows, that we're gonna call a fill in question. It's a fill in the blank question. So let's create a new class together and we're gonna call it fill in question. And I'm gonna drag it over here. So it's by my other question stuff. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna work our way through this a little bit. We're gonna need to use the scanner class. So let's import it now at the top, just so we don't forget later. So I'm gonna do import java.util.scanner. And let's write a, a good description of what this is. So we know what it is. So a fill in question is constructed with a string that contains the answer surrounded by the underscore character. Okay. For example, let's make this more concrete. The text could be the inventor of Java, Java is underscore James Gosling underscore. Okay. So that's what the teacher could provide when constructing a fill-in question. And then the question should be displayed as the inventor of Java is with just a blank. And then you can put your name and the date here if you want. And I'm gonna delete all the starter template code. We'll do our own thing. Right. So this is, this is what we're looking for. So in the slides we went through, we said when we're gonna go define a subclass, there are like four different steps we went through. Um, and the first step is to specify that we are extending from the superclass. So let's write a little comment here to explain how we do that. The fill in question class extends, that's the keyword we use in Java. By extends, I mean is a subclass of or is derived from, different ways of saying the same thing, the question class. And the syntax for doing this in Java is it's still public class fill in question. We add extends keyword and the name of the superclass. Public class fill in question extends question.
simply by doing this, we have we could stop right now. And it's not super useful, but we just automatically got all the instance variables from question. And we automatically got all the methods from question without doing anything else. That's the code reuse. That's not to say we don't want to override some stuff, add some extra stuff, but let's do that. Let's do that tomorrow. So I'm going to pause here today. Um, we just got started yesterday writing our fill in question subclass. So we're writing our first subclass that we've got. Um, we're creating a subclass because we need different behavior than the superclass. Um, the different behavior we need is that our, the text of our question, the prompt of our question has the answer embedded inside of that. We obviously don't want to display that to the student. So we need a different behavior here where we can extract the answer from the text um, and have this question behave appropriately. So yesterday we basically just wrote the subclass header. So just to review that, this part's familiar, public class fill in question. The new part is using the extends reserved word to specify that the fill in question class extends, that is it's a subclass of the question class. So the class after the word extends is the superclass. The class before the word extends is the subclass. Okay. When we're creating our subclass, this is the first step. We write the subclass header. The second step is that we declare any instance variables that are unique to the subclass. Okay. Um, like we might need different instance variables. In this particular case, I don't think we need any different instance variables. Um, and the one thing I just want to be really clear about, and it's definitely worth a comment, is just a reminder that we inherit the instance variables from the superclass. So we inherit the text and answer instance variables from the question class. We do not want to re-declare those here, um, which is the most common pitfall we fall into as we're learning how to do subclasses. So let's leave a warning here in our notes so we don't do this. Do not declare the instance variables text and answer. The text and answer instance variables are inherited from the question class. And we're going to revisit this again in a few minutes because it's such a, a common pitfall that we, we, we trip into. So, all right. When we write a subclass, it's still like writing a normal class in a lot of ways. Um, we still need to write a constructor, okay? And the, the class documentation we wrote previously says, hey, a fill-in question is constructed with a string that contains the answer surrounded by underscores. So we need to write a constructor to support that. So let's write our Java doc header, just like we always do for the constructor for our fill in question class. So this constructor constructs a fill in question object with the specified text that contains the answer. The fact that the specified text contains the answer is the specialized behavior that warrants us creating a subclass in the first place. It's gonna have one parameter, Let's call it question. And it is the specified question text with the embedded answer. Writing this constructor header is just like all the other constructors we've written all year. We want our constructor to be public. It has no return type. The name of the constructor is the name in the class, name of the class, fill in question. It takes one parameter of type string, which we're going to call question. Okay. That's all pretty normal. Here's what's new about writing a subclass constructor. 
if we think about the purpose of a constructor, the purpose of the constructor is to initialize the objects like instance variables, its state, when we make a new object. So when we make a new fill in question object, we want this constructor to initialize that fill in question object and specifically any instance variables that we, we have. We don't have any in this case. The additional complexity when we deal with inheritance is that we can't just initialize the fill in question. We also need to initialize the super class. Okay. And so, and in fact, the order in which we do that is important. It's, it's completely reasonable to think that a subclass may depend upon the state of its superclass. So we better make sure that the superclass gets initialized before we initialize the subclass. To a certain degree, Java enforces this and it does some stuff automatically for us. Um, when we say new fill in question, this code is going to run. And if we don't explicitly state anything otherwise before any code in this curly brackets run, Java will automatically call the default constructor for the superclass to make sure it's initialized first. If that's the behavior we want, great. We don't have to do anything special. Sometimes that's not the behavior we want. Like in this particular case, we don't want the default superclass constructor to run. We want this superclass constructor to run where we can actually specify the question. Um, so if we want something other than the default behavior, we have to explicitly call the superclass constructor. And we need to make sure it is the very first thing we do in general um, in the constructor for the subclass. So let's make a note about that. These are some of the rules when it comes to subclass constructors. So in this case, we want to explicitly call the question classes constructor that takes a single parameter. We don't want the default one. How do we do that? Or, or what's the rule about that? When do we do that? Calling a super classes constructor must, there's some exceptions, but we're going to go with must, it's mostly true, must be the first line of code in the subclasses constructor. If we don't explicitly call a superclasses constructor, Java will automatically call the super classes default, meaning no parameters, constructor. So the super class constructor is going to get called. If we don't explicitly do it, Java is going to do it automatically and it's going to call the default one because it has, doesn't know what else to pass. If that's not what we want, we better be explicit. Here's the syntax for how we call the superclass constructor. We use the reserved word super followed by parentheses. And in the parentheses, we put whatever parameters are needed to call the superclass constructor we want. Since we want to call this superclass constructor, which takes one parameter of type string, we better put one argument in these parentheses, which is a variable of type string. So that's the syntax for explicitly calling the superclasses constructor. If we were to run this code as currently written, we could create a fill in question subclass. It would inherit all the instance variables and methods of the question superclass. When we make a new fill in question and we specify the question, it's going to call the superclass constructor and it's going to run this code. It's going to call the set text method and it's going to initialize the instance variable. That's not the behavior we want, right? Because if we just left it as is, the answer would still be in the question, right? And the students would see the answer when they're prompted for the question. So we need to change the behavior 
of the super class, of the question class, um, specialize it for our fill-in question. And in fact, that's the very reason we're writing a subclass. And we can do that by overriding a method. Okay. The method that we want to override is the set text method. We don't want to simply take the parameter and assign it to the instance variable. We need to extract that answer out of it first and replace it with a series of like a blank instead. Okay. So here's how we override a method. Um, first, let's write the Java docs for the method, just like we always do. Um, we're going to say this method overrides the set text method in the question class. And what this method does is it sets the question text, question text and answer. We want to set both. So that's a different behavior. We're going to actually set both the question text and the answer. The set text method takes one parameter called question text. And it is the text of the question, including the answer. When we override a method, we, we do the method header just like we normally do for all of our methods. We want this method to be public. If we look at the super class, we can see the return type of set text is void. So we want it to match. The name of the method is set text. And it takes one parameter of type string. So we'll say string. Technically, the name of the parameter variable question text doesn't have to match the super class. But why not make it the same for consistency? I think it makes sense. So by defining this set text method here, we have overridden that method. Meaning when the set text method is invoked, it's going to call this code instead of this code. That's what overriding is all about. The second most common pitfall we run into when we're dealing with inheritance, and this specifically relates to, relates to overriding methods, is we intend to override a method, but we make a typo and we accidentally overload it, okay? What I mean by that is what if I misspell the method name set text? This still compiles just fine, right? Um, but it's gonna be really confusing when my program doesn't work because this code's never gonna get called. It's always gonna call this code instead because this is now a totally different method. It's set txt, it's not set text. I'm not overriding anything. Okay? Sometimes we get the method name right, but we mess up the number or type of the parameters. Let's say I make question text and int by mistake. It still compiles, but again, I'm gonna be really confused when I'm running my code and it doesn't work. And this code never gets, never runs when I pass in a string because it matches this method here that expects a string. Right? This overloads the set text method. It does not override it. Okay. Here's a, 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 a extra tip that we can use in Java that helps catch these mistakes. All right. This is not something you would ever do like on a written free response question or like on the AP exam, but we do do it when we're coding because it saves us a lot of headaches. Um, and what it is, and we'll add a little comment about this, it's super useful. We're going to use the at symbol capital O override annotation. So in Java, things that start with an at symbol are called annotations. We see these with our unit tests. I actually had some override stuff in some of our earlier labs, like with paint component. But we're going to use the at override annotation when overriding a method to help the compiler verify that you are in fact overriding and not overloading by mistake. So 
So in, on the line immediately before the method header, we're gonna say at override. And what's great about this is by adding that annotation, when I now compile, I get a compiler error saying, hey, this method doesn't override anything. Hey, I know you intend to, but you're not doing it. Um, so it doesn't even compile. And then I can be like, oh yeah, this, this is supposed to be a string. Cool, now it compiles. Or if I misspell the method name, doesn't compile. Hey, this doesn't override anything, right? This will save us so many headaches because it's really confusing when we think we override something and we don't. So please, in your code that you're typing, use the at override. Don't worry about it when you're writing out code like on an exam or anything. All right, so the whole point of us creating this fill in question class is to have different behavior for how we set the text of a question. Right? So let's write the code now to actually extract the answer from the question and then do all the right stuff. We're gonna use the scanner class for this. And I'm gonna create a local variable called parser of type scanner. And I'm gonna make a new scanner object. Usually when we've used scanner, we pass to the constructor system.in and we read from the terminal. We can also scan another string. So we're just gonna scan the question text string. By default, when we use scanner, and we call the next method and we break it into tokens. Tokens are separated by white space. That's not really the behavior we want for this example. We want to parse based on that underscore character because that's what separates, that's what specifies the embedded answer. We can change the delimiter. You may remember delimiters from last semester. We can say parser.use delimiter and specify the underscore character. Now, if I have a local variable of type string and I can call it question and I call parser.next, in our example, what this is gonna return is the inventor of Java is space. It returns all of the characters up to, but not including the delimiter, the underscore character. And then I can have another local variable called answer and call parser.next again. And the next string that's gonna be returned starts after the underscore and goes up to, but not including the next underscore, which is just our answer, James Gosling. And then we can use string concatenation to add some underscore characters for our blank and whatever the rest of the question is. So I'll call next a third time. And what we're going to concatenate here is the blank and there's a period and that's it. This right here is the specialized behavior of a fill in question class that makes it different than a regular question class. We just extracted the answer from the question text and broken to two local variables, the question with a blank and the separate answer. That's our specialized behavior. Often when we get to this point, we're pretty excited, like we're almost done. And so we're like, oh, we just have to store the question and answer appropriately. So we look back at the question class and we're like, Ah, text is the instance variable for the prompt, the question. Answer is the instance variable for the answer. Let's say this.text equals question and this.answer equals answer. Sweet, we are done. And we hit compile. And it doesn't work. It says text has private access in question. Here's the pitfall that we we very often fall into. We run into this and we're like, oh, I need to declare text and answer. And we go up here and we say private string text, private string answer. And we're like, yeah, it compiles, I'm done. Right? But we just did exactly what we're not supposed to do. If we do this, the fill in question object inherits an instance variable called text and answer from question 
and has a second instance variable also called text and a second instance variable also called answer, all part of the same object. So we have duplicate instance variables and this is not gonna end well for us. So please resist the temptation to do this, right? Don't do that. Deleting, deleting, deleting. The solution is also not to change this to public. Changing our instance variables to public would violate our principle of encapsulation, right? Instance variables in general should be private. The solution is to use the accessor and mutator methods defined by the superclass, like set text and set answer, instead. Right? So let's let's comment this out because we don't want to do this. But let's add a little comment here reminding us that the inherited instance variables are private. They cannot be directly accessed. We must use, must use the mutator and accessor methods. So here's where we are. We want to call this set text method. However, we're in the overridden set text method. If I were just write this dot set text, when this line of code runs, it's going to call the overridden set text method. And we're going to do all this again. And then we're going to run this line again. And it's going to call the overridden set text method. And we're gonna do this a third time. And we're gonna call it again. And it's gonna go on forever until our program runs out of memory and crashes. Okay. We need a way to say, wait a minute. I know I'm in the overridden set text method, but I wanna call my super classes version of this method. And this is really common because usually when we override a method, the super class gets us part of the way there. We just need to have some specialized behavior either before we call the super class version or after we call the superclass version, or sometimes both. And the way we do this is we use the keyword super in a slightly different way. So we're gonna say use the super reserved word to call the set text method as defined in the superclass. In this case, that's question. So I don't say this, I say super dot set text. Unfortunately, um, this is an inconsistency in the Java syntax that I'm not a huge fan of. James Gosling didn't ask me for my opinion at the time, um, which is fine. But um, so here, I just want to be clear about super. When we're in a normal method, we use super dot and the method name that we want to call on the super class. This syntax is really similar to this, right? This dot some method we're calling within the same class. Um, so super dot method name is what we use to call the super classes version of a method, generally when we're in the overridden version of that same method. That's different than how we use the super reserved word followed not by a dot, but by parentheses and arguments to call the super classes constructor. Okay, so we use super in two related but different ways. We use it like this to call the super classes constructor. We use it like this to call the super classes method. So we just have to get used to those two different syntaxes. Cool. What this means now is we've extracted the answer from the question. When this line of code runs, we're going to update the instance variable as appropriate. We still need to call the set answer method to set the answer. And the way we do that, the best practice is to say it this way, this dot set answer answer. Not super dot set answer, right? In this particular example, both would work, okay? It's best, better practice to say this dot set answer for the following reason. Um, let's capture that because this is important. We should use this, we should use the this reserved word to call this set 
answer method. Why? Well, here's why. Um, it, well, first of all, it's going to work. So if the subclass doesn't override the set answer method, which we didn't, the superclasses method will be called. Okay, so it's going to work. When we say this dot set answer, the Java runtime says, "Hey, does this object, does the class of this object override set answer?" No. Okay, just call the superclass version. Great, it's going to work. So why not call super? Well, it's more to prevent us from running in trouble in the future. We don't want to use the super reserved word in this case because if we later do override set answer, the overridden method would not be called. So maybe we come back to this code in a week and we're like, you know what? We do need specialized behavior for set answer. Let's override the set answer method. But if we had written this as super dot set answer, we wouldn't, it wouldn't call the overridden method. It would explicitly call the super classes version of set answer instead. And our program probably wouldn't work as we expect. So general rule of thumb, when we're calling methods, call this dot the method just like we have all year. The only time we say super dot method is in general when we're actually overriding the very method we're calling. So since we're overriding set text and we want to call the super classes set text method, this is an appropriate use of super. Pretty much all other times, we'll just stick to this like we have all year and we'll let the Java runtime figure out the right thing to do. And this compiles, yay. One challenge now that we're doing more with inheritance is that the flow of execution gets even more complicated. And so I wanna actually step through this code together in the debugger to help us understand the relationship between the subclass, the superclass and everything else. So I'm gonna re I'm gonna open up this question demo class so you can see what this looks like. So here's code I've already written for us. Question demo. Um, it's got a static main method like we're accustomed to. It's gonna create a scanner object to get user input. Um, now that we've actually written the fill in question class, let's delete this code here. So the line reads question Q equals new fill in question. So we're gonna make a new fill in question object. We're gonna print that object. We're gonna prompt for an answer. We're gonna read in the answer and we're gonna check the response and print true or false if we get it right or wrong. Okay. I'm gonna set a breakpoint here so we can actually step through this code together. So I'm gonna run this main method. Here's the debugger. We're on this first line of code here, so I'm gonna step over that. We have our scanner object. And I'm gonna step into the code to create a new fill in question object. And when I do that, hopefully not surprisingly, we're in the fill in question constructor that has the right number and type of parameters. That's nothing new. Here's what is new though. We're about to execute this line of code that says super question. And when I do that and step into this, we're now in the question class and in its constructor that has a single parameter of type string. Okay. So we're jumping between the different constructors as we go. It gets a little bit more complicated, to be honest. We're about to say this dot set text. Okay. And here's a really important concept when it comes to overriding methods. The Java runtime, not the Java compiler, determines which overridden method gets called. And what I mean by that is when the Java runtime is going to call the set text method on this, it says, what is the class type of this, right? Does, is this of type question? Is this of type fill in question? Is this of type choice question? 
Um, the type of this, the type of the object we're in the middle of constructing is a fill-in question. So the Java runtime says, oh, well, in that case, I'm going to call the set text method in the fill-in question class because it's been overridden. It doesn't matter that we're in the question class. This is a runtime decision. This line of code doesn't necessarily call this method if it's been actually overridden. This is like the fundamental way that inheritance gives us a huge amount of power that we're going to be exploring over the next like week. So when I hit step into here, we're not going to jump down here. We are back in the fill in question class where we have overridden the set text method. Okay. So when you're tracing through code, you always have to do what the Java runtime does. You have to check what is the type of this object. And I'm going to call the appropriately overridden method based on the type of the actual object, not based on the type of a variable or anything else. Okay. And we'll do a lot of practice with that. All right, so here we are in the overridden method. We're going to create a scanner. We're going to set the delimiter. We're going to parse up to the first underscore, which we did. The inventor of Java is. That looks good. We're going to grab the answer. Here's James Gosling. That looks good. We're going to put together the rest of the question by adding some underscores in the period. That looks good. And now we're down here and we're about to say super dot set text. And so when I step into this line of code, we jump into the question class now. Here's the questions version of set text. And we're going to initialize that instance variable. And now the text is actually the inventor of Java is blank. Perfect. And we keep going. We're about to say this dot set answer. What the Java runtime does is says, hey, I know I'm really a fill in question object. Does fill in question override set answer? Oh, no, it doesn't. All right, well, call the super classes version instead. So we're back in question. We're calling the set answer method. We set the answer appropriately. We keep stepping out. We're now finishing up the constructor for the question super class. When I step out of that, we're now finishing up the constructor for the fill in question class. And now we're back in our main method. We'll print out the question. Here it is. We'll prompt for the answer. Let's get it right. When I hit step into here, it's going to call the check answer method on Q. Q is of type question, but that's not really what matters because the Java runtime knows that Q is really a fill in question object. So it's going to actually check does the fill in question class override the check answer method? It actually doesn't. Okay, so we'll call the super class. And sure enough, here we are in the check answer method of the question class. We're going to see if the variables are equal. They are, and it prints true. So I hope that illustrates how the flow of execution is a little bit more complicated. Um, we're jumping between different classes a lot, um, and that's going to take some practice and some getting used to, but the debugger can be a super useful tool to help us do that. Let me close this. Let me close this. Let me show you where we're headed next. Um, now that we have this like more concrete example, um, if I go back, we can look at where, where we are here. We could, we're not gonna do all this, we could create several subclasses of question. We just created fill in question. There's already code for us in choice question. We're gonna look at that tomorrow. But we could create like a numeric question, which expects like a numeric answer. And so we're not going to check if the two strings are equal. We're going to check if like the number numbers are actually equal. Um, maybe even we allow some tolerance, like they could be within a specified value. We could have a free response question that can't be automatically graded. It requires the teacher to grade it. Um, I don't know about multi-choice here, maybe more like multiple correct question, where it's still a multiple choice question, but it could be A and C as an example. That could be another subclass we could create. 
And maybe this would be more of a specialized subclass of choice question. We can have subclasses of subclasses. That's totally fine. In terms, so this is a high level design class diagram just focused on the relationships between the classes. Sometimes we write a more detailed design class diagram, which shows the superclass, shows the superclasses instance variables, shows the superclasses methods. All of this gets inherited by the subclass, in this case, choice question, which might have its own instance variables and its own methods. So this is a way that we can diagram the relationship between the superclass and the subclass um, in a very concise way. We also have our Java memory model, right? We have our physical model involving like the turtles and the Wii remotes. We have our conceptual model where we use a sheet of paper for each and every object. We can still use that, but one slight change we can make is on the sheet of paper, we still put the name of the class, like the subclass choice question. But on that sheet of paper, we want to include the instance variables of the superclass because they are inherited. But we could draw a little line to separate, hey, these instance variables are inherited, but they're private. These instance variables are unique to the subclass choice question. Just to help us visually identify what can we access directly and what do we have to use access or mutator methods for. Okay. So that's a slight change we can make to our Java conceptual memory model, if we want. Last thing I wanna share with you, just to reinforce this, because this is such a fundamental concept and will not be the last time we talk about it, is this concept of dynamic method lookup, which I referred to when we were looking at the code in question when we call this dot set text, how does Java determine which set text method to call? And that's that dynamic method lookup thing. Here's the thing to keep in mind. The way we determine which overridden method to invoke is based on the type of the actual object, right? Whatever we said new blank with, it is not based on the type of the variable. If the variable is type question, but the actual object it references is a fill in question, we're going to call the overridden method and fill in question. That's the power of dynamic method lookup. Okay. What is really cool about this is that we can treat different subclasses in the same uniform manner as the superclass knowing that we can refer to everything as questions. We could have like a list of questions, but when we call these overridden methods, the right overridden method is gonna get called, okay? This is huge, 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 huge. We're gonna reinforce this tomorrow with one, not tomorrow, sorry, Monday, with one more example related to choice questions. Not so much code we have to write, but code that's already there, we'll step through um, because this is such a fundamental concept. Um, so that's, we're gonna circle back and hit this on Monday because um, it's a really important part.